So let's keep going on with that Venetian blind thing. It's the Venetian blind analogy helps you see the purpose of having everybody united and fitting together. Of course, the analogy that's used in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 12, body. The coordination of the body. And that's actually the better analogy because it's easier to understand. God is building the body, a.k.a. bride, for Christ. And it's really important to say this this way. Because there's a big debate that's been going on for a while, at least among Protestants, about whether the, all of the body is the bride or not. Well, answer is yeah. Because the analogy is made to a body. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about the mystery of Christ. And he's talking about marriage. So he's talking about church as bride. And he's talking, therefore, about body as bride. And, of course, he's talking about body in 1 Corinthians. And he had written 1 Corinthians, and then Romans came next. And then after that, Ephesians. Okay? Um, I forget exactly when. It's in Luke Dateline Meters PDF, But I want to say that Romans was written about six months after Corinthians and Ephesians was written maybe a year later, a little over a year later. If I'm wrong, it'll be in it'll be on the first two pages of that document because I show the meter and I show the date because the meter tells you when he wrote it. Now, presenting just for the sake of argument that's true, he's writing Ephesians and Romans also comes out maybe a little bit before. Uh, but Ephesians definitely comes out because he goes to jail. Okay, he's writing Ephesians in jail. All the scholars agree on that, and they very rarely agree on anything. They agree on that. He's in jail when he writes Ephesians. Now, he might have started. My big question with that book is maybe he started writing it before he went to jail. Okay. And it's real important to say that because of the, the timing. Luke's book of Acts comes out at the same time, and so does James. Because all those books were triggered by Paul being imprisoned. But did the, did the books get written like in a hurry? Or was part of it written and then set aside, waiting for God to elaborate, and another part written later, and then they were all, you know, knotted together, so to speak? I don't know. Presumably there'll be a way to tell. But, I, you know, I've only metered the first chapter of every book in the New Testament. So I don't know about the subsequent chapters, if they've got their own metric dating system built into the text to tell you, hi, I'm writing this a lot later. I mean, Isaiah did that. Isaiah chapter 53 is written at a different date than Isaiah chapter 1. And he uses the dateline meter that's kind of like piggybacked on his dateline meter in chapter 1. In chapter 53, he uses a dateline meter that kind of plays back to chapter 1 so that you know that it's a different date and it's still him. It's real interesting how these, the, how the Bible authenticates itself. But in any event, the point I'm trying to make here is that kind of like the Bible, just like a body, a body of writing. You got letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, connections to other words, sentences, paragraphs, elsewhere in the text. And the question is, as a whole, it has a coherence. But it also has individual coherences in the words, in the sentences, in the paragraphs. And we all use the Bible that way. How many times do we each quote to each other just a snippet of part of a Bible in different places? 
and we're using that as our law about what is or is not true or what is or is not right or what is or is not a doctrine we all do that in fact that's the way everybody uses it Jews and Christians alike for 3,000 years the Bible itself does that practice so here you got a body has individual parts which have a certain independence of their own irrespective of the rest of the body but at the same time the whole body is hello fitted and joined together whether it's a body of writing or a body of, of anything a dog a human an animal a, a insect body of a computer you got all these parts in a computer and they all kind of have their own independent existence in nature but they all fit together to to form something larger than their individual self okay well then the whole body is depicted by Paul in Ephesians 5 as the bride Now, what is that telling you? Well, when you're a child or you're not very well trained, there are certain things you can do. And then there are certain things you're not trained enough to do. But you are capable of doing some things. The same thing is true for adults. Some adults got extra education or training or talent or something which because of that they are able to have a job that's different and often higher than someone who doesn't have those skills or abilities. And a lot of times skills and abilities are things you choose to learn. Okay, there's some things that you just have to have a talent for, but most things, no. And even when you have a talent, if you don't train in it, your talent is pretty much worthless. So now think about that. Learning and living on Bible is a practice which creates a skill, which creates a knowledge, which creates a higher skill, and an ability to think like God. People aren't equal in that. They don't choose to equally learn. And here in particular, it doesn't matter what your abilities are or your IQ is. Do you want it? Then you get it. And most people don't want it. But they're still part of the body. They're saved. So somewhere in the eternal state, like a child, like an unskilled person, God is going to create a job, a place for them to be able to do something. But they won't be at the top of the kingdom. But they're still body. You see the difference? So it's all synergistic. It's designed to be synergistic going back to my Venetian blind thing. But like a body, your arm can move independently of your feet. But your arm is not really the equal of your feet. You need your feet to walk. Arms don't, generally speaking, walk. They do other things which most people, if you had to choose between being able to use your foot and use your hand, most people would prefer to have their hand than their foot because you can do more things with your hand. So they would consider the hand superior to the foot. But you could also argue it's not different, capable of doing more things, but better? Well, I don't know. Now, in the eternal state, nobody's going to care about better or worse. It'll be true, but it's, it's not going to be the big ego problem that it is now. 
We're all going to be so excited just to see and know God. We're not going to give a whole flip whether how we compare to each other. If somebody's got something that's higher than me, I'll be very happy to say so. And I'll be enjoying watching them have it. And if I'm the one who's higher, I'll be enjoying saying that too. So will you. See, a lot of the angst down here comes from people being obsessed with whether their particular set of abilities and skills is better than somebody else. And the answer is, why does it matter? It's a fact. It has an issue with regard to, like, you know, you don't want to give a klutz something that requires dexterity of fingers. So it doesn't matter to know, but why does it matter if somebody's better than you? God made you. He wants you. So why do you care how you compare to somebody else? But underneath that, there is a valid and obviously God-created desire to be useful, needed, helpful, productive, to be worthwhile, to have a life that is, you're doing something worthwhile and your existence is worthwhile. And that's where the better than, worse than gets all tangled. People are beginning to think of worthwhile in terms of better or worse than. If you're better than me, then the insecure person wonders, well, and then am I worthwhile because somebody's better than me? But of course you are. The question of worthwhile is not black and white either. Can you say that your foot is worthwhile? Of course. Is your foot worthwhile because your hand is more worthwhile? Sure. So why is it hard to say, aren't you worthwhile because somebody's better or worse than you? But are you worthwhile given what you can't do? And of course the answer is yes. God gives you something. We're all worth something. There's at least one thing per person in this life, no matter what a scallywag we are. There's at least one person, one thing in this life that each person is good for. And you take away that person, then you take away that thing he's good for. So therefore it's justifiable the person exists. But you didn't necessarily create the thing that makes your existence a necessity. So then it doesn't matter if you're worth more or less. You can enjoy your own worth, and you can enjoy anybody else's worth. And people who adjust to this life, whether they believe in God or not, that's basically how they think. They're not concerned that somebody is better or worse than them. They're happy with what they got, and they're happy with what the other people got. And they're happy to watch them be better or worse. I don't mean happy like ha-ha and triumph over, but content. They don't lord it over those that they're better than, and they don't feel particularly upset that others are better than them. Because you're you, and there's no other you. You don't have to justify your existence. That's how God does it. That's how the eternal state's going to work. And what he does is he foreknows all the decisions we're all going to make, and what he wants to do in co as consequence, and he just decreed that that be. So he basically decreed freedom. His and yours. Okay? And part of that is, well, I know how I want the eternal kingdoms to all fit together to reflect my son. And therefore, if you make it as a king, then all these people he's going to give you reflect you because you reflect Christ in some key way and by them listening to you they will reflect him more in the same way 
And then it's like all the mosaic pieces fit together and it reflects him. And Father just loves the way that is. Because he sees it already before it's even happened. So it's not like he has to wait. See how this works? And the same thing for you and me and everybody else. So now think about that. Your plane of existence, all the other planes of existence for everybody else in your potential kingdom are all happening right now. Assuming that you become the king and they become your subjects, God already knows a billion years from now where what the result will be due to what's happening today. So to him, this is like the Venetian blind turning. This is the body of Christ already existing. Okay? And for that reason, he's not being shortchanged. And neither are you. You just don't know the results yet, but you will. He knows them now. Which is good, because then you don't have to worry about how you screw up today. Because he's already got a plan for that. Same thing for somebody else screwing up on you today. He's already got a plan for that. You just don't know what it is. But he knows, and he's seeing it already. Well, but isn't that what you really want? If it's... If if it pleases him right now, and surely it does or it wouldn't exist. If it pleases him right now, does it really matter when it is that you find out why that's true? You're going to find out. You just don't know now. You know, we don't worry about Christmas coming. Because we know it'll come. So we don't worry about... Oh, what are they going to get me for Christmas? Because Christmas will be here soon enough. Then you'll know. Okay, death will be here soon enough. Then you'll know. Death and Christmas are the same. Every day is Christmas, really, but you know, it takes a while before you get to that recognition. So, all of these... Body parts are being knitted together. Your plane of existence and all the other planes of existence that are going to be underneath you in your kingdom. They're all functioning. Now. The seed form of what they will be. Paul calls it a pregnancy in the last half of Romans 8. So the lower planes of existence that everybody else is living on. It's okay. And the most important thing to say about it, and this is the part i got to remember that he keeps reminding me of, the people who have it want it. See, righteousness really isn't righteousness if it isn't what a person wants. If you force somebody to do or be good, that's not really righteous. In other words, a whole lot, and I grew up with people like this, drove me nuts. A whole lot of women, they really, their interests in life are what's immediately in their vicinity. They're not interested in the big picture. They're interested in what they ate for lunch and who remembered their birthday and whether or not they got meat on sale at the market and the glitzy fashion magazines and anybody they can gossip about. That's what they like. Whether they got a blue dress or a red dress and they can change the colors of the dresses and and whether somebody paid them a compliment f over their hair. That's their sense of self-worth. 
that's their sense of what is worthwhile. Not mine, but it is theirs. There are others who are real concerned about their pet causes. And they spend all of their time on their pet causes. And God help you if you ask them a question. Because then they'll talk for 20 minutes on their pet cause. That's what's important to them. Shouldn't God create a heaven where a person who's picked out a certain set of interests be able to live that way? Okay, but, you know, not everything is equal. A person who futzes over her hair versus somebody who's concerned about, you know, the laws of thermodynamics. Well, you know, the laws of thermodynamics are kind of more important. But not to the person fixing her hair. So should the person fixing her hair be forced to abandon that standard that she wants to have in favor of the laws of thermodynamics she could care less about? And the answer is no, it wouldn't be righteous. So God creates a place for the person who wants to futz over her hair. That's her idea of happiness. That's her idea of value. That's what she wants. Is it objectively equal to other interests? No. But shouldn't a person who wants that get it? I mean, it's not immoral to futz with your hair. Right? So everybody has a place in his own plane of existence that he chooses to have in heaven forever. So heaven's going to be full of people who, you know, down here in this life, the gender was female, the concern was picky and stuff like futzing with your hair. And that's the way their interests are expressed. That's the kind of interest that they have. So that's the kind of interest they can pursue forever in the eternal state. Now, it won't necessarily be hair. But it'll have something to do with appearance. It'll have something to do with all that primping. And they'll really love it. To me, that's my idea of hell. But not to them. You get what you want from God. So the key here is integrating the whys of integration. All of these different interests in different planes of existence got to be integrated into a body that's coordinated and works together for good, Romans 8, 28, in the eternal state. Think about it.